sessions today, if you need one, I think will be two more weeks. We have uh, three more sections. So I think our final section is on um, why we don't listen to rock and roll. We're going to expand that a little bit uh, into some, probably tackle one of the questions I got that we're going to tack onto the lesson there. And, uh, and we'll expand a little bit on today as well. And because um, we asked a question of smoking, uh, it certainly raises a question, a larger question on health and so forth. And I, I find uh, I've seen two tendencies, even in my own thinking and among Christians, and that is to go to two extremes, to say, well, you know, uh, it's just my body. It doesn't really matter. God concerns about what's inside of me and to neglect health. And then I've seen the other side where people get enamored with their bodily or physical health to the neglect of their spiritual well-being, getting things out of order. We don't want to do either one of those. We find the Bible addressing health. Um, he doesn't make it. God doesn't want to be our focus, but we do need to remember our bodies are the temple of the Holy Ghost. And so these are questions we get, uh, of course, um, why we don't gamble, why we don't uh, drink alcohol, some of these different things we've covered already, those two main subjects and really in dealing with why we don't gamble we're able to expand that further for what is the underlying sin behind gambling that's the love of money uh, and so the love of money the love of money is the root of all evil dealt with a message on thursday night that addressed much of that and the danger there is in coveting and loving money and as americans i would say this for an american citizen that subject covetousness ought to be something you take some time to study in your bible because our culture is so inundated with covetousness. There are certain cultures, they really need to be aware of slothfulness. We all need to be aware of all these things. But in our culture, uh, covetousness is a major sin, and we don't want it to creep into our lives as Christians. And so gambling is a revelation of that. So let's, let's address this one today, uh, maybe uh, not quite on the same scale as the last two we've looked at, but nonetheless something that we would believe Christians should not do for a number of reasons. And so why don't Baptists smoke? Now I'll give you the name of a famous Baptist who did smoke for a time. I mean, you know, Charles Spurgeon used to smoke cigars. Uh, he did. And, and there was a point in time where people started advertising, I think without his permission, smoke Spurgeon's cigar. And he realized what a poor testimony it was for him, and he quit smoking. And so um, that, that would be his testimony. And so, of course, there was a time then maybe we didn't know as much about it as we do today. He lived in an era where they might treat your, your respiratory problems with putting you in a smoking chamber. And uh, they would also bleed you out and try to get your disease out by emptying your blood out of your body. And they would have done well to read the Bible. The life of the flesh is in the blood. And so sometimes we experiment with things. We could save ourselves time by just, you know, paying attention to what the Lord has said. But that's true for all of us. So let's, let's go ahead and tackle this issue today. Uh, why don't Baptists smoke? And so um, we're not going to review the last two weeks because we took extensive amount of time. If you uh, were not here for that and you have questions, we have those lessons available. They're on YouTube. They're available on CD. They will be, I'm not sure, are we putting those on, we're not doing Sunday School on podcasts, right? But they're available if you would like uh, access to those and then the lesson forms as well. So let's just jump right in here. Uh, smoking, like so many other drugs, nicotine being the, the drug that's in there, is addictive. And that's why so many Christians have a real problem in this area. And, uh, and so smoking and other harmful drugs should be absent from your life for three basic reasons. And he's going to give three basic reasons. I think we could probably expand on any of these. But, of course, the first one is a physical reason. Uh, it has to do with the detriment to our physical bodies. I would say this. We need to stay free in every facet of our life. So... This question opens questions to other areas of our life. Well, can I eat that? Should I eat that? And again, people can go too far with this, but the fact is Paul said, all things are lawful unto me, and all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. And so when something takes control of our life, when something has power over us, it really doesn't matter what it is. That's something that needs to be changed at that point. Something's not to have power over our lives. We should be able to say, you know what? I'm going to go without that today and then not wreck our day. I'm going to go without it this week. Um, this, sometime, you know what? We need to be more in the habit of, I believe this, a lot of these habits we get into would be fixed if we'd follow the biblical pattern of fasting on a regular basis. Take some time to fast and pray. Fast a meal, fast a day, fast a couple days. But fasting and praying is something that's 
most American Christians don't ever even consider. It's, it's not even on their radar screen. Fast and pray? Jesus fasted. We don't do that, right? Moses fasted. And so it's a discipline to say, you know what? So, for instance, fasting is saying no to that which is allowable. There's nothing wrong with eating. I'm addicted to food. I'll just tell you that. I'm addicted to food, and so are you. So we're not talking about what you need to function, right? Fasting is not saying no to the forbidden. Fasting is saying no to that which is allowable so that we can focus. We, we put away physical things so we can focus on spiritual things. We put away physical bread so we may focus on the bread of life. And I would encourage you to incorporate, and again, take a, take a meal, take a breakfast, if somewhere to start and, uh, and consistently do that, or take a day uh, and focus on that. I believe this, when you're going to fast and pray, have some time to focus on that, and there's another lesson for another day. But I think this touches on the same issue, and that is the ability to be temperate, to say no to self. Uh, tobacco, unlike alcohol, is not mind-altering. Now, I understand it can have effects immediately on the, you know, people make people dizzy and sick to their stomach, but it's not mind-altering like other drugs. We're not suggesting that. So uh, it's in a different category. The Bible doesn't say tobacco is a mocker and it is raging and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. That's, it's not as clear. I'll just say this. Tobacco use, such as chewing it or smoking it, is not as clearly articulated in the Bible as alcohol. God's abhorrence of alcohol is quite clear. Whereas with this, it takes a little more spiritual discernment to say, you know, it's something we're not going to do. So let's lay out the reasons why so many of us as Christians have come to the conclusion, no, we can't smoke or use tobacco with a good conscience, okay? Um, and so here's, here, let me just say this. There are a number of things. How many have seen this um, research that says chocolate will kill you? And then other research that says chocolate is good for your health. It just, it's, it comes and goes. It's not definitive. When it comes to tobacco, it is definitively destructive to your health. This is not any longer in question in the sense of when you're, in, you're chewing it or you're smoking it. It's, we know it is a, it is a, a cancer-causing, uh, and not only that, emphysema and different things that come from this. It's, you know, over and over. This is not up. It's not a question. This is established. This is detrimental to your health. And so we start with the physical reasons. Common knowledge that smoking is harmful. And we're gonna say not, I'm going to not just limit this to smoking, uh, you know, dipping snuff, chewing tobacco. Um, these things are, are harmful to many times even deadly. Unsaved people quit smoking for this reason, even the more ought a, a Christian. Now, I'll say this. When this lesson was written, smoking would have been more popular than it is in our day. And so there's always a temptation on everyone's part when something's popular or seen as cool to take part in it. So, for instance, if you grew up in the 1950s, in the 1960s, every cool guy and gal on the screen had a cigarette in their mouth. That was part of the marketing, is you take the people that look really cool, and whatever you want other people to buy, you let them know you're not cool, whatever word you want to use, you're not in if you don't do this. Now, you tell me, what is the very dis deplorable, provable sin today that we're pinning on all our celebrities today? What's that? The sin of sodomy. It is still, for the most, the average person understands that's unnatural and it's deplorable. But we're making it look acceptable. And I'm not putting these two things in the same category. I'm talking about how the world puts pressure on us to engage in things that we ought not do. And so I believe smoking became very popular for a time because it was promoted on the screen. It was promoted on billboards. And you see, you're not cool if you don't have a smoke, right? And so uh, there are entire cultures today, the athletic culture. You're not one of the guys if you don't have a dip in your lip. You know I'm telling you the truth. If you're in the, uh, the athletic world, uh, you know, if you play baseball, you got to chew. You got to be spitting something, right? And uh, it's really cool. <clears throat> anyway, um, if you can step back for a few minutes and say, what are we thinking? You know? uh, but the fact is it's physically detrimental uh, to our bodies. I'll say this. I believe... The sin of smoking, and it is, I believe, a sin because it falls under the sin of foolishness again. We know the outcome. We know eventually the outcome. And so uh, let's look at what the Bible says. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, uh, verse 19. The Bible says that our body as believers in Christ is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Our body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. And so, and it doesn't, listen, it doesn't matter when you get saved, when you come to faith in Christ, 
when that takes place, then now the Spirit of God is indwelling. I would say this, we need to, what happens is a lot of times we, when a person gets saved, they have things that they have done with their body they wish they had not done. Paul said this about his own Christian experience, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. How many understand you cannot undo your past? So God doesn't expect you to go back and undo your past. He does not expect you. He expects you to agree with him. Repentance is, I agree with God about the things that are wrong, but you cannot go back and undo what's been done. What we can do is live for the Lord from this day forward. I can say, you know what? I'm going to do what he wants me to do now. Understanding my body is not my own. Have you ever heard the term bodily autonomy? Of course you have. You've heard it in a couple of contexts. Number one, supposedly, you know, when it comes to destroying a child in the womb, there's bodily autonomy, except for the child. They have no bodily autonomy, just mama, not baby, right? Now, when it comes to enforcing health mandates, bodily autonomy, out the roof. We don't, that's done now, right? So uh, bear with me. May I say this? For the Christian, you and I don't have bodily autonomy. Our body belongs to Jesus Christ. He bought it. When he purchased us with his shed blood, we became his, and the Holy Spirit of God came to dwell in us. And this is the this is the principle that's going to help us with so many decisions with our body. What we put in our body, what we put on our body, what we come out of our body. We need to understand this, this body belongs to the Lord. And I've heard professing Christians say, well, it's my body. Somebody doesn't understand what it means to be a Christian when they say that. It doesn't mean they're not saved. If you don't understand what it means to be a Christian, you say, well, it's my body. I'll do with it what I want. If you have that attitude, you're in rebellion against God. That's just, I mean, that's the truth of it. Yeah, or you're not saved, and then you're still in rebellion against God until you let the Lord Jesus save you. But that attitude is unbecoming of a Christian. Say, so, well, it's my body. No, it's the Lord's body. 1 Corinthians 6, verse uh, 19. And this is staying in the context of, of immorality. It says, what? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For you are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God. So our physical body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. It is sacred and ought not to be defiled by any known harmful substance. Our body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Uh, now our flesh has a hard time with that. And by the way, if I push back at that, then I'm really pushing back at his authority in my life. And so these seemingly secondary issues are revealing issues because they're areas where we get tested. We're going to let the Lord have control of my body. Am I going to let him determine the kind of speech that rolls off my tongue or the kind of substances that go into my body? There's a common idea today that if you're a Christian, has your body, you know... Um, People almost worship their bodies today, supposedly in the name of Christianity. Some, that's that one extreme side. But there's almost a disconnect between how I conduct myself and my body is a reflection of what's in my heart. And so that would include this as well. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 27, the Apostle Paul said this. Again, these principles are broadly applying. They don't exclusively just apply to smoking or using tobacco. This is just kind of an obvious one uh, because of, of how established... Uh, it is as far as its detriment to us physically. There are other things that would be right there with it. So 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 27, Paul said, but I keep under my body. What's that word keep under mean? Literally means to beat black and blue into submission. Who did this to Paul? That doesn't mean he physically beat himself up, but that's the context. I keep under my body. I keep it under control. I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I've preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. He's not talking about being cast away from the family of God. That word castaway is the term used when someone was kicked off a team in athleticism. So you disqualified yourself for usefulness in God's service, and that would line right up with 1 Timothy 2. When we separate some things from our lives. It makes us meet for the master's use. It's not how you get saved. It's not what makes you righteous. It's what makes you usable for God. And so that needs to be very clear. We're not talking about a path of salvation we're talking to people who've already been saved through faith in the shed blood of Jesus Christ. They're trusting in him, but I want God to use me. If you're saved, you want God to use you at some level. So some of these things we decide to do and say, you know what? So let's, let's apply this. This is not a question. I don't, I don't think we really talk in this lesson a lot about language. 
But let's say we're used to using certain words and we realize when we use that word, we're sending the wrong message. Maybe it's cursing God's name, even if it's euphemistically. And we have people we're trying to witness to and they call us on that, say, don't talk to me as long as you cuss like that. You know what? Not stopping cussing doesn't save your soul, but being saved should stop you from cussing. Just say, you know what? I, I want God to use me as a witness, so I'm not going to use that language anymore. And uh, that's where we're coming from on this. So for physical reasons, uh, tobacco use is detrimental to our bodies and our health, and so we should uh, forego that for physical reasons. Number two, or letter B, for emotional reasons, all right? For emotional reasons. By the way, I'm going to read you another verse here in a few minutes in 1 Thessalonians 5. How much of our being does God want sanctified or set apart for his use? Spirit, soul, and body. We'll read, by the way, that's where we get the idea we're a triune being. Because the Bible says we are, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. It articulates that we are a spirit, soul, and a body. How I many you know a lot of people in the world don't believe that? They don't believe that you are a triune being, spirit, soul, and body. I don't know how else they explain who they are. I had someone stay at my door a few weeks ago, and I asked the gentleman talking to me, I said, are you a spirit or a soul or a body? He, I'm not being unkind to him. He could not answer my question, or would not. I'm not sure which. Well, I'm, I'm you know, you know. <laughs> I said, well, just think about it. Just, just think about it. Are you a spirit, are you a soul, or are you a body? And he really, it just, he could not he couldn't get a hold of what he was. <laughs> he knew he's more than a body, but I think there's a realization if I say I'm a spirit, soul, and body, I'm acknowledging I'm made in the image of God, and I have to acknowledge there is such a thing as we would call the Trinity, and that God is one God in three persons or uh, manifest in that way. So anyway, uh, we are a three, three-part being, spirit, soul, and body, and God wants, we're to glorify God in our body and in our Spirit, which are God's. He'll talk about spirit, soul, and body. So soul has to do with the emotions, right? So we're starting with, there's, there's bodily reasons we shouldn't use uh, tobacco. There are emotional reasons. Uh, number one, uh, many people take up serious smoking and drugs because of underlying emotional causes. Boy, how true this is. Insecurity, anxiety, uh, and it becomes a deadly crutch. Addiction is a terrible, terrible thing. And I would say it's very important to beat any kind of addiction to, to, to realize where's this coming from? What am, I, what am I chasing? And I'll say this, when we get addicted to something, we're looking for what God can give us in something else. And then it grabs hold of us, right? I mean, I think at a base level, that's what happens. So there's emotional reasons. This is, you know, addictions are not. I mean, I say this, to those who don't use tobacco, we have to watch doing this with food. Food. Wrong foods, bad foods, foods that... You know what? When I'm extremely tired, man, I have to watch my, my consumption of sweets. You know why? Because I'm tired. And I, I, I don't even, it just occurs to me, why are you wanting to eat something sweet again? You don't need anything sweet. Well, I'm extremely tired. So I have to watch that, right? And, uh, and so I think it's, this is a good lesson for any, for any person in this room, that we have to be mindful that, uh, that we, not, um, we not run and look to things like that. Uh, to meet our emotional needs. And so it's many people take up serious addiction, become seriously addicted to things because of underlying emotional problems. And that's true. Uh, the believer is to be careful for how many things? Nothing. Be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication. I want you to think practically. And please do not answer out loud because it's going to vary in answers and this just needs to be between you and the Lord. But I want you to think how often, you, uh, let's say, 10 out of 10 is 100%. Of the times you're feeling anxious, careful, and troubled is your first recourse prayer. Just think it in your own conscience. How often do I think, okay, because I'm feeling careful and troubled right now, I need to pray and then pray. God's antidote for our troubles is prayer. Be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your request be made known to God, and the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. I realized years ago, my first recourse was think. When I'm feeling troubled, chew on my problems. Think them through. How many of you ever got a really bad piece of um, sirloin steak when you were like before you were 10 years old, and you chewed it, and you chewed it, and the more you chewed it, the harder it became to chew. And it got bigger in your mouth. Anybody know what I'm talking about? 
It got like a sponge, and it grew in your mouth. You think, why did my parents put this on my plate? This is leather. This is not meat. And listen, now, with our problems, you know what we do? When we chew on them and chew on them and chew on them, you know what they do? They grow. God didn't say be careful for nothing, but in everything, really think a lot about your problems. He did not, but that's what we often do. Or, let me tell you, there's a time to call a friend, right? When you're playing Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? Is that, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> That's in the past. So we're like, what is that? <laughs> All right. No, there's a time to call people and get counsel. But you know what I find as Christians? We often don't use prayer until we absolutely have to. And God says, that's not the way it's supposed to be. And so one of the things that we can incorporate, and I, by the way, think it's, it is necessary to teach things we ought not do but anything we ought not do needs to be replaced with something we ought to do. So when you're battling any, any habit, any bad addiction, you need to battle it with two things primarily. The Word of God and prayer. The Word of God and prayer. And they should not be our final recourse. And it should be our habit of life. That's what I'm going to resort to. In prayer, not, I'm not running to prayer. In prayer, I'm running to God. God wants to show himself strong on my behalf. He wants to deliver me, but I've got to look to him. I'll give you another illustration. When I was a boy in my teen years, I had a lot of headaches. I don't know if it was part of growing or what it was. I had a lot of headaches. Probably didn't drink enough water, to be honest with you. But my mom would say, I'd come say, oh, mom, i got headaches. She said, well, I'm sorry. She said, I have some ibuprofen. Do you want to take some? I don't like taking medicine. So I'm like, nah, I'll pass. And I'd go play for a bit or go do some work and come back. Damn it. So is your headache better? No. Did you take any ibuprofen? No. So I remember one day, and I wouldn't. I would not take ibuprofen. I didn't want to. I didn't want to take ibuprofen. I don't know if I was too lazy to open the bottle. I don't know what the deal was, but I didn't want to take it. Probably because mom suggested it, I'll be honest with you. That was probably <laughs> it. So I remember one day saying to my mom, I'm probably 16 now, 15, 16. I said, Mom, I got a headache. She said, have you taken ibuprofen? I said, no. She said, then don't say another word to me about it. I've had enough. If you won't do what I've recommended, don't tell me about your pain. Now, sometimes we have problems in our life and the Lord says, pray. Oh, I don't know what's going on. Why am I doing this? What's going on? I don't know. I can't get direction. I don't know what to do. Pray. Oh, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. Have you prayed? No. Don't tell me about it then. I gave you a solution. You did not exercise that. No solution until you take what I've provided for you. This, isn't, this goes along with what we're talking about today. Let's talk, I'm not off course here when I'm talking about smoking or other habits. We need to be a praying people. And if we watch ye therefore and, and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. The spirit truly is ready. You know how many people really want to do what's right? They really do. I, I, there are plenty of people in this world that don't want to do what's right. But save people somewhere inside of you have a desire to do what's right. But the flesh is weak. How to perform that which is good I find not. Meaning, I'm going to try this without God empowering. No, we need, God's, we need God's power. And therefore, he lets some of these things abide in our life that we may learn to depend on him for our daily successful living. That we can say, you know what? If I'm living successfully for God, it is by his power. It's by his grace. I'm depending on him. And so may I encourage you, um, if you're going to fight some addiction like this, whether it's smoking or eating something we know is detrimental to us or anything that has power over us, we need to counter that with prayer. And by the way, if I counsel with somebody that's fighting some addiction and I come back and say, are you praying about this? And they say, well, not really. And we do that about three times, I'm done. I cannot help you because we're not acting on what God has given. When we really want to do God's will, we will receive from him what he's given to us. He says, hey, come boldly to the throne of grace that you may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And what, you know what will happen when you battle something like this? This is how we develop a prayer life. You learn to pray constantly. Because if you're battling something like this, you need constant grace and help from God. And so for emotional reasons, instead of turning to some substance for our enjoyment or pleasure or fulfillment, should we not turn to God? And then he'll provide the things that we, he, give us, he gives us richly all things to enjoy. Some people have this idea, boy, Christians live a drab life. They probably sit around and drink water and eat bread all day. And do you realize the Lord, the Bible says he ate butter and honey. I mean, you like butter and honey. Some people try to say sugar is evil. Well, I beg to differ. Honey's chock full of it and the Lord Jesus ate it. So 
don't be addicted, don't eat too much. And I understand refined is different. We have all that discussion another day. But there are those that say, oh, all these things are bad. Well, not really. You know, all dairy is bad. My wife can't handle dairy, but all dairy is not bad because he ate butter. Some people say, you shouldn't eat meat. Well, Jesus did. I'm good with it. He ate Passover lamb. For non-meat eaters, sorry, you're, that's not in your book. If, you're, if, you're, if you can't digest that, that's fine. You're free not to eat it. But So there are people who say, oh, boring Christians. Have, no, you live for God. He'll fill your life full of wonderful things. But he needs to be who we're running to and depending on, and uh, he'll help us with our emotional needs. And so really a lot of times behind the habit is an underlying emotional problem that the Lord could resolve. And then when you resolve root problems, it re resolves fruit problems. Amen? And so physical reasons, emotional reasons, and then, of course, there's spiritual reasons a smoking Christian is often a poor testimony, whether right or wrong, whether people are misjudging you or falsely judging you. Because you know what? We all understand smoking doesn't make you not saved. That's not what the Bible says. But it often is a bad testimony for the Lord. And the world believes that the Christian is supposed to be clean in his habits, and they're right. And so one of the great obstacles to winning souls for Christ is, uh, is tobacco breath or any kind of bad breath, for that matter, as he states. And that's true. Um, and so Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6, 12, I'll, be, I'll not be brought under the power of any. I'm going to have something controlling my life other than God. And so I'm not going to be brought under the power of any. Again, that's 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12. And I encourage you to meditate on that verse and understand it's a Christian's duty to keep under our body. We're to be temperate under the direction of the Holy Spirit of God. I knew of a man years ago, and uh, I've heard this story repeated but he had, he had gotten saved, he'd put his trust in the Lord and was so glad to be saved, glad to know his sins are forgiven, and he still smoked. He tried witnessing to his brother, and he always had a pack here in his pocket, and I don't remember what brand he smoked. But his brother thumped him on the cigarette pack, and he said, don't tell me about what's happened to you as long as you got those in your pocket. So he went and threw them away. <laughs> he said, I'll not have anything hindering my testimony for Christ. And that was it. I, I, don't want, I want people to know what Christ did for me was real. My grandpa's testimony was very similar. The church he served in had a requirement. If you're going to usher, you couldn't smoke. You could be a member of the church, but you could not serve in that capacity if you still had, if you were still smoking because of testimony's sake. And so he said, I want to serve, man. I want to serve. Today, you'd sue the church for discrimination. But back then, you said, you know what? That's a good thing. They're motivating me to do right. You know what grandpa did? He said, you know what, if that's hindering me from serving Christ in that way, then I'm done. I want to serve the Lord so much that I'm willing to put that aside in order to serve Christ. Um, it saddens me today. It really does. I just want to say this before we move on. As churches, we seek to hold a standard for those who serve so that we reflect a good, on a, we want to re give a good reflection to the name of our Savior. We don't want to give people reason to blaspheme the name of God and his word. And so we'll have standards like that. We have dress standards for why people sing. And then somebody will say something nonsensical like this. Well, that church believes you're going to hell if you, you know, smoke a cigarette. No, we don't. We don't believe that. I had somebody say it about me one time. So you're teaching your children that if people smoke, they're not saved. No, I don't. I never believe that. I wouldn't teach that for a moment. But if you're saved, represent the Lord well in language, in deportment, in how we look and how we behave, not just at church, but every day of the week. Amen. We ought to be the best representative. And we're not talking about putting on some, you know, uh, we're talking about just knowing, okay, what pleases the Lord? What causes other people to doubt what I'm telling them is true? If I cuss like a sailor and say I'm on my way to heaven, somebody's going to say, if you're on your way to heaven, why do you talk like you're on your way to hell? I don't understand. Well, then change your language. Amen? And so this is what we're dealing with. And, the, and, and I started to say what's sad today is people who want to continue in those things have to got, they've got to find a way to justify themselves. So what they do is they attack those who would teach them to go forward and say, you know, it's legalism or it's this or that. How about think about changing? <gasps> Novel idea. How about changing the way I think or the way I live? You realize I understand my job as a pastor is not to come along, slap you on the back, and say you're the best thing since sliced bread. Nor is that your job with me. But as a preacher, as a leader uh, of God's people, aren't we supposed to challenge people to go forward in conforming to Christ instead of feeling comfortable where we're at? And then as we do, commend, praise God, wonderful. Stay on course, that's good. But the fact is, we have such an environment of affirmation that, you know, and I'm sorry, you have to just bear with me. I think 
get your feelings off your shirt sleeves and let's we're we're soldiers we're as Christians and I understand there's babies and they need to be brought along but hey if you've been saved 25 years you're a soldier I cannot imagine anybody in the military having a drill instructor in your face that you hurt my feelings yeah right we don't, and I understand we're not going to be obnoxious I'm not talking about that but really on these issues we, we need to think okay what honors the Lord not what pleases me and, not, and, and it really has to do with loving Christ. It's really what it boils down to, loving the Lord Jesus Christ and wanting to serve him. Now let's move on to this next section. We'll just tackle this one today and stop. Uh, why Baptists don't dance? Now this is another one. Boy, we get heckled on this one, right? Why Baptists don't dance? Now, I want to read you a verse. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And we're just going to let this one soak in for just a minute. Um. I'm going I'm to paint a picture for you first, and then I'm going to read you this verse. Let's say you walked into church this morning, and you found me lovingly embracing a woman here in the front of the auditorium. You're like, whoa, that's not his wife, and that's not his grandma. Who is that? Well, she's just a friend. Would anybody have any concerns? And you should. Get your Louisville slugger and give me one. Right back of the head. You got problems, man. Get right with God. But if it's dancing, it's okay. I'm talking about waltzing around the room with some other man's wife. We do the same thing with dress standards. Can you imagine somebody coming into church this morning seeing a special in a bathing suit? But on the beach, it's okay. Are you with me? It's, it's okay to be immodest on the beach, but it's not okay to be immodest in church or at the grocery store. Well, anymore, it's okay to be immodest anywhere. <laughs> not in God's sight, not in God's sight. But the fact of the matter is, we, we make these little criteria of why certain bad things are okay in certain settings. So it's not okay for me to go embrace some other man's wife and waltz around the room with her because it's called a dance. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. Now concerning the things whereof ye wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless... To avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband, right? So when we say why Baptists don't dance, we're beginning with dealing with what has become traditional dancing in our culture, okay? We're going to deal with what the Bible talks about dancing. There are times the Bible says, praise God with the, the dance. So now we have churches doing what they call interpretive dance. They got Herodias' daughter on the platform doing sensual things in the name of God, and it is doubly wicked because it's in the house of God. That's not what the Bible's talking about. Amen and amen. And if you think it is, let's sit down and have a sensible conversation. With God's word, I'll do my very best to change your mind. But so much of dancing is sensual and sexual in, in, its, in, its, in, its, uh, in the overtones. And so 1 Corinthians 7 says, hey, it's better for a man not to touch a woman, but if that's, but nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife. The clear insinuation, and not inference, the clear instruction of that verse is, touching between a man and woman is between a husband and wife, this kind of, of sensual touching, okay? Um, may I say this? In this church, I discourage everybody going around hugging everybody else's husband and wife because God says hug. You know what I find? Guys who like to hug other men's wives don't hug their own like they should. Look, I've been around for a little bit now. I'm not an old man, but I've been around. And guys who are always touching some other man's wife don't hardly touch their own. That'll preach for just a bit. And the Bible says you want to touch, marry. You touch your wife. Keep hands yourself. Amen? Years ago I was teaching this, and I had a lady here in the church, and she was ornery. And she came to me and said, Pastor, what about greet one another with a holy kiss? I said, the key word there is holy. That's the key word. If people were around greeting one with a holy kiss, I wouldn't have a problem with it. What you're talking about is not holy. We didn't discuss that any further. It was the end of that conversation. Uh, because that's not what she had in mind. She was a hugger, right? We're not hugging everybody. And I, I understand some people are like that when you just need to think. But we do need to think. And when it comes to dancing, we're talking about on a dance floor, a ballroom style. This is an intimate embrace that, that would, if it's ever okay, it's between a husband and wife, Right? So that's where it would be okay, but not with somebody else's husband or wife. Many times the kind of dancing, mess them. 
where does most dancing we know come from today? Where, is it, where do you associate that with? We're going to talk about rock and roll next. Bars? Yeah. And coming from the, the wrong kind of music. It's all about sensual stuff. And yet, we've brought that into the house of God. I mean, there are churches this morning that call themselves churches, and they're going to have people worshiping in interpretive dance, people dressed extremely immodestly, provocatively is the Bible word. And so Christians need to have a clear head on this. Um, and so first and foremost, dancing is, is a practice with strong sexual overtones. What does the Bible say about fornication? Get as close as you can without committing it. Flee. Flee fornication. Stay away as far as you can from sexual immorality. You run from it like the plague because it is. Do you remember what Balaam introduced to the children of Israel to destroy them? He couldn't curse them. God wouldn't let him. So what did he do that brought God's wrath upon them? He got them to commit immorality. God will always, Hebrews 13, 4, marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers, God will Judge, that's in the New Testament under the New Covenant. That's not a Mosaic law thing. That's a moral thing. God will judge adulterers and fornicators. Dancing is a bridge to immorality. You mark my word. Uh, we'll see a text here in a minute. And throughout the Bible, the kind of dancing that is common today in the Bible is condemned. So people say, well, God said, worship, praise God with a dance. Well, I'm glad the Bible gives us an illustration of what that is. Have you ever watched Hebrews sing their music? Jewish people, you ever watch how they dance? I'm not going to demonstrate for you this morning. I don't want to ruin your day, right? Uh, walking and leaping and praising God, Acts chapter 3. It is excitement. It's kicking up the heels, right? It's not grabbing some guy's wife and swinging her around the room uh, and wishing she were your wife, right? Uh, that stuff's wicked. That's not, that's not, and I understand people have done it and, and taught there wasn't anything wrong with it and they, but that's why we have Sunday school, to instruct. No, 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 that's, that's not a good thing. So the Bible associates dancing with evil. Almost every mention of dancing in the Bible has some negative connotation to it. So, for instance, when the women went out to dance, the Benjamites, that's how they went and got their wives after the, all their wives were killed in battle, or the, the men were killed in battle. There were no women left for these guys, and so they went out, and the, the girls were out dancing. They went and st stole their wives that way. Just almost always a negative connotation with it almost always not always but almost always and so it always when it's the kind of dancing that's popular in our culture today exodus chapter 32 would you turn there please this is the first mention of dancing in the bible exodus chapter 32 exodus 32 and by the way you try dancing to nothing but the blood of jesus you have to change your music if you're going to change the conduct and the behavior in the church house. This kind of music that creeps in, creeps in, by the way, it doesn't always creep in rock and roll. It creeps in in the form of gospel music. It stirs your sensuality inside of you, but you can say, well, it's okay because it's in the name of gospel. You got, you got music that your flesh craves. You better turn it off because this is the kind of stuff it leads to. Music is a powerful powerful conduit, powerful form. Uh, and I, look, our church needs help on this right now, uh, the entire, this whole church. You need to get conviction set on music because it's a tool that is so often used um, to bring in immorality and idolatry. I can tell you, any church I've seen slide. You know where it starts? In the music. And it doesn't start when music changes on the platform. It starts when music changes right there. Because what music you love, you eventually have to have it up here. You with me? Yeah. And so we find Exodus 32. I made this statement this last week. It's not surprising that Moses could hear the music associated with Israel's sacred cow before he saw the cow. You know what? Our music is an indicator of where our heart is. Whatever music you love today is... You know what? Here's, here's what the Bible says. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual, song, hymn, spiritual songs while you're at church. There are many people that have, their, they have their, their life divided into two categories. My life at church and my life in the car. When I get in the car, it's all secular stuff. From people who hate God, curse his holy name, live like the devil, and then I'm going to let them influence my life through their music. And then we wonder why we can't get any traction spiritually. 
You cannot fill your heart and mind with content coming from reprobates without them influencing you. So I do psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs in the worship service, and I do all the other stuff all the other time. So what does it have to do with dancing? Everything. How many of you ever seen people dance without music? It's very uncommon. All right, they go together. Yeah, and so these, these things are all, they're all linked together. So let's notice this, uh, Exodus chapter 32. We're not going to read the entire text, but I'm going to read some key verses. This is about the worship of the golden calf. Uh, Exodus 32, verse 4. And he received them uh, at their hand, talking about the Ten Commandments, and uh, fashioned it with, uh, excuse me, it's not talking about the Ten Commandments, it's talking about the uh, Aaron, the, the, the earrings for the golden calf. And he received them at their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool after he had made it a molten calf. And they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. Verse 5, And when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. I thought it was to a golden calf. You have to package your idolatry in worship. You, what does Aaron say this is? Here's an altar. This is a feast to the Lord. Was it really a feast to the Lord? Or is he spiritualizing his idolatry? He's got to make himself look like he's doing right when he's doing wrong. Verse 6, And they rose up early on the morrow and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings, and the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. So a few things associated with this. Verse 4, you find idolatry. And the dancing that's taking place around the golden calf, there's idolatry here. There's drinking, verse 6, and you, you'll find in this text they were dancing around the golden calf. Look at verse 29, uh, verse 25 rather, excuse me. And when Moses saw that the people were naked, for Aaron had made them naked under their shame among their enemies. So there's all kinds of things associated with this dancing that's taking place around the golden calf. This is a sensual type thing, and there's drinking, there's nakedness, there's idol worship, idolatry. And so uh, we find that in Exodus 32. In Matthew chapter 24, and I'll address uh, in just a moment what I believe would be what the Bible would categorize in a good sense uh, when it talks about praising the Lord with a dance and so forth, because these are the texts of Scripture people will quote. What's ironic is often many people do what they're going to do without any thought of what the Scripture says, and then when they're challenged on it, they go and run for a proof text. Oh, well, yeah, we got somebody up there dancing like Herodias' daughter, but praise the Lord with the dance, right? No, that's not how that works. <laughs> uh, I mean, it is sadly how it often works. But it's not how it's supposed to work. We're supposed to seek the Lord's mind and do his will. And so in Matthew 24, 1 through 12, of uh, Matthew 24, why keep misquoting? Forgive me, Matthew 14, 1 through 12. Matthew 14, 1 through 12. I'm not going to read the whole thing. But the Bible talks about here how on Herod's birthday, verse 6, when Herod's birthday was kept, the daughter of Herodias danced before them and pleased Herod. I mean, just know what kind of guy Herod was. He was a great Christian man. Not on your life. He's a wicked guy. If it pleased him, this was not a good thing. Pleased him so much, he said, hey, ask for half of the kingdom and I'll give it to you. Do you realize what cost John the Baptist his head? A wicked woman putting her daughter up to dancing. She knew what Herod liked. He said, you could do that. He'll like it so much he'll give you whatever you ask for. And what I want through you is John the Baptist's head. She got it. So the daughter of Herodias is here dancing and, you know, very clearly not a good thing. Not a good thing. In 2 Samuel chapter 6, verses 12 through 21, again, we're not going to read it for time's sake. You'll have to do your own homework there. The Bible speaks of David dancing before the ark of the Lord, and he did. Number one, notice a few things about this. There are people who say, well, David danced, and he did. I, we won't even argue that. But he danced alone. What woman did he have in his arms? This is not a waltz. He danced alone. There was music being played. They're bringing the Ark of the Covenant into the city according to the law of God. David's dancing before the Lord. Uh, so it's alone. It was out of extreme joy. So he's extremely happy about being able to bring the Ark of the Covenant in. And even so, and I'm going to, uh, we don't know his wife, Michael, accuses him of, of revealing himself, of showing nakedness. I don't know if that's true or not. Michael was a stinker, for lack of a better word. She did not love the Lord. She was an idolatress. I don't know if he exposed himself or not. We don't know that. She accused him of that, and she's the one that suffered for that, not him. God never rebuked him for this, never chastised him for this. What I would more say is the dancing you're talking about in the Bible is when someone is so excited, they're leaping and jumping such as we would find in Acts chapter 3, as we close this morning. Acts chapter 3, verse 8, when God healed a man, it explains how he responded. Now, there are charismatic churches that would say, oh, then lose yourself and go out and jump. On. How many of you know when you force yourself to leap and jump, that's not the same as when you're so excited? You ever, you ever get so excited? 
You go with me and watch me drop an elk, you'll see me dance. <laughs> I'm like, yes, right? That's about as close as I'll get. Uh, you really won't. But I'm going to be excited, right? And I'm not going to hide that excitement. Um, Acts chapter 3, talking about the man that was uh, lame, and he's, he's healed. It said, and he leaping up stood and walked and entered with him into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. This man is so excited. He is walking and leaping. That's dancing. That's the only kind of dancing you're going to find in the Bible that God's okay with. When someone is so overjoyed with what God has done, they cannot contain themselves. They're going to kick their heels up and <laughs> hallelujah. By the way, some of us would be okay to get a dose of that, right? Be excited about what the Lord's done for you. It wouldn't hurt us, right? Um, but you can't fabricate. How many of you know this? When you fabricate that, so there's a church service where it's all fabricated. We're going to put on a show. and No, that's not what it's talking about. It's talking about being overjoyed with what God has done and expressing that outwardly. We're not talking about grabbing some other man's wife and disobeying God. We're not talking about some sensual, provocative movement. We're talking about an expression of joy. Amen? Is there a difference? And thank God we have a Bible that illustrates it. Walking and leaping and praising God. So the next time he says, well, we believe in interpretive dance. Say, well, I'm interpreting what's going on, and it's not a good thing, right? Uh, it's not hard to see what God is okay with. And so there's reasons we don't dance, and there are Bible principles that are violated, amen? And so if you have more questions on any of these, feel free to bring them. I'll try to answer them. We are out of time.